Welcome to our video, The Plot Against Russia, How Putin Revived Stalinist Anti-Americanism to Justify a Botched War. I would like to focus on the commentary in Foreign Affairs, May 25, 2023, by Mr. Andrei Kolesnikov, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Russia Eurasia Center. This is Part 2. America First, Russia Second. As much as official Russia has often been anti-American, it has also long been obsessed with U.S. economic power and even U.S. goods and food. One of the main slogans from the 1960s Khrushchev era focused on matching and then overtaking the United States in terms of per capita meat, milk, and butter production. When Putin came to power, the idea of catch-up development was hardly less present. In some sense, America first is effectively one of Putin's slogans. Everything is viewed through the prism of the United States and the West. To be different means not looking like Western people and not living like them. More precisely, it means achieving similar successes while relying on one's own strength, upholding sovereignty and originality, and practicing import substitution. In other words, both the Russian state and society continue to measure themselves against the yardstick of the United States and its European allies. The pattern goes back to the earliest Soviet years. American bourgeois specialists appeared in the Soviet Union during Stalin's industrialization drive in the 1920s and 1930s. The Soviet writer Valentin Katayev depicted them somewhat ironically. But the truth is that without U.S. technology, it's unlikely that an industrial breakthrough would have been possible. When the United States presented the American National Exhibition in Moscow in 1959, an event that attracted more than two million members of the Soviet public, who tasted Pepsi and got their first look at American washing machines, Nikita Khrushchev and Richard Nixon had their famous kitchen debate at the fair site in which they discussed the relative merits of capitalism and socialism. At the time, the Soviet leadership clearly felt its backwardness in the consumer sphere. This was also why the Soviet Union had to lead the way in the space race, to break free of the catch-up matrix. America. A Russian-language magazine about American life published by the U.S. State Department, was a coveted item although less so than jeans, chewing gum, and soft drinks. Characteristically, the magazine was banned in 1948, when Stalinist anti-Americanism was in full force, and was released again during Khrushchev's anti-Stalinist thaw in the 1950s. At the beginning of 1970s, Leonid Brezhnev gladly accepted prototypes from the U.S. car industry as a gift from the Americans, adding to the atmosphere of détente. And when the Soyuz and Apollo missions jointly docked in space in July 1975, it was commemorated in Moscow with the appearance of real Virginian tobacco in cigarettes named after the historic event. Not the choking fumes of the motherland, but the fragrant aroma of another world. By the twilight years of the Soviet Union, Soviet industry was so dependent on Western supplies and technologies that the sanctions imposed on Moscow for the invasion of Afghanistan put entire industries, such as chemical engineering, in jeopardy. Even in the post-Soviet era, the Russian fixation with U.S. models and Putin's talk of a U.S.-imposed unipolar world created a sense of unavoidable dependence on them. Respondents in Russian focus groups would sometimes say that Russia's 1993 constitution was written in Washington and that Putin's amendments to it were required to make the country truly sovereign. At the same time, however, people understand that the United States has been an economic powerhouse from which Russia could learn a lot in order to achieve the same standard of living. Once again, a combination of Russian superiority and Russian inferiority has been simultaneously expressed in Moscow's contradictory attitude toward its American rival. Still, until Putin returned to the presidency in 2012 and Russia annexed Crimea in 2014, 
Russians' complexes about the United States were not so noticeable. In the initial years of his rule, beginning in 2000, Putin was still adjusting to the West and wary of squandering the legacy of Boris Yeltsin, his predecessor. He did not see Russia as a trendsetter in the Western-led world order. The open hostility to the West expressed in Putin's speech at the 2007 Munich Security Conference, however, marked the start of deteriorating relations with the United States, delayed only slightly by an attempted reset during Medvedev's four-year presidency. By 2014, Moscow's new emphasis on Russian pride and reawakened great power aspirations brought back all the old hang-ups about the United States, stirring up a quasi-patriotic hysteria. But the strongest manifestation has surfaced since the special operation began last year. Since then, Russian attitudes toward the United States have worsened drastically. In February 2022, 31% of Russians had a positive attitude about the United States. A year later, according to the Levada Center, the independent Russian opinion research organization, just 14% of respondents had a positive view of the United States, and 73% had a negative attitude. The decline in positive attitudes toward Europe is not far behind. Just 18% of Russians polled had a positive opinion of EU countries in February 2023, compared with 69% who did not. When combined with conspiracy theories and Putin's own growing isolation, Russian fixations with America have become a potent recipe for militarism. Putin's embrace of conspiratorial anti-Americanism is especially dangerous because of his regime's growing disregard for the old red lines. During the Cold War, at least, both sides agreed that the consequences of inflicting damage on each other would be unacceptable. Putin's problem, in fact, the whole world's problem right now, is that the Russian government lacks the one instinct that since the late 1960s has consistently led to détente with the West, the willingness to negotiate. Instead, Putin has suspended cooperation on nuclear nonproliferation, discussed the possibility of a nuclear strike with infantile levity, expressed teenage grievances, and shown an unwillingness to maintain even a minimal level of dialogue. All of these actions unfavorably distinguish Putin's anti-Americanism from that of his late Soviet predecessors. The political personality of Soviet power as we know it today, Kennan wrote in 1950, is the product of ideology and circumstances. If one looks at the sources of Russian conduct today, the circumstances are a dictator obsessed with his mission. As for the ideology, Russia's new foreign policy concept refers to the country's special position as an original state civilization, a vast Eurasian and Euro-Pacific power, a noteworthy new term. This concept further cites Russia's role in consolidating the Russian people and other peoples that make up the cultural and civilizational community of the Russian world, a geographic space whose borders are not specified. The eclectic essence of this ideology, which has re-emerged at various stages of Russia's historical development, was described astutely in Vladimir Nabokov's conversation piece. 1945, a short story in which a former white army colonel who emigrated to the United States declares, the great Russian people has waked up and my country is again a great country. He continues, we have had three great leaders. We had Ivan, whom his enemies called terrible, then we had Peter the Great, and now we have Joseph Stalin. Today, in every word that comes out of Russia, I feel the power, I feel the splendor of old mother Russia. She is again a country of soldiers, religion, and true Slavs. In his Victory Day speech on May 9th, Putin said that Russia's enemies were notable for their ideology of superiority. It is interesting that he uses almost everything that can be said about him, exorbitant ambition, arrogance and permissiveness, as he put it in his speech, and lays it at the door of his opponents. 
Herein lies the deeper purpose of Russian anti-Americanism. To attribute everything that you yourself are plotting, all those immoral plans you are hatching, to the United States. But this resurrected ideology also reflects the disappearance of the bipolar Cold War order and the loss of Russian greatness and power that have come with it. Thus, when Putin and members of his team talk about a new multipolar world, they are simply trying to reassert Moscow's lost superpower status and portray themselves as a guiding light for the former Soviet republics and the countries of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. All of this is a consequence of the psychological trauma of the collapse of the Soviet Union, which the elite who came to power in 2000 carried with them. 22 years later, that trauma has resulted in a global catastrophe. That's all, from the Commentary in Foreign Affairs, May 25, 2023, by Mr. Andrei Kolesnikov, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Russia Eurasia Center.